Uh, my name is David Soren. I'm the lead pastor here at Renovation Church. Morning to you. Uh, as a church, uh, last week, we started a brand new teaching series on this letter of Jude uh, in the Bible. Uh, and I said that Jude is considered by most scholars the most neglected book in the New Testament. And I think that's for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, because it's kind of, it's in the back. Uh, I think that's part of it. Uh, two, it's really short. Uh, and three, it is just a fiery a letter. In fact, you're going to see that again in today's uh, passage. So much so, I can almost guarantee that probably none of you in this room have heard a message on this particular <laughs> passage before, but that is where we are. And I think this is important to hear because if as Christ followers we are going to understand who God truly is, then we've got to read all of the book, right? Uh, if, if in America our churches continue to just kind of skip over the hard parts and the hard books and we kind of skip, we just stay focused on this kind of Instagrammed like faith where we just share like the really inspirational things, then we're not gonna understand who God really is. It would be like if you didn't know who Michael Jordan was and you said, tell me about Michael Jordan. I said, well, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's 6'6", he's kind of uh, funny and intense and really competitive, but then I left out the fact that he used to play basketball, right? Well, you wouldn't really know who Michael Jordan is is we need to get a full picture of who our God is. Okay, so everybody grab a Bible. Uh, Bibles are under the chair uh, in front of you. Uh, we are gonna be on page 836 today, uh, Jude 5 through 11. Uh, last week, <clears throat> excuse me, last week, we started just with verses one through four, and we saw really the central point of this letter, which Jude says we need to contend for the faith. And specifically, he told us that we need to contend for the truth of our Christian faith against false believers who would pervert the grace of God into a license for immorality, a license to sin. Now, Jude, as we transition to five through 11, is gonna show what happens to these false believers if they live out their life that way. Okay, so let's, let's read right at uh, small number five. Jude says, though you already know all this, by the way, some of the best preaching is reminding. It isn't always just new information. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah in the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings, so angels. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare himself to condemn him for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand, and the very things they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. Woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's heir, and they have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Uh, welcome to church. <laughs> Whoa, okay, this is an intense passage of the Bible. And I think it's difficult because A, it challenges a particularly our Western modern thinking. And secondly, it's a difficult passage that most people never treat because Jude lists uh, not one, but seven references to the Old Testament times in just seven verses. Uh, here are the seven verses. We'll put it on the screen for you. I actually really encourage you to take a, a picture of this or write this down. In fact, you might even want to do both in case it changes uh, to a different screen here in a few minutes. But these are the seven references to the Old Testament times from this passage. And a lot of these stories are not very well known uh, by Christians. One of the reasons I want you to write this down or even take a picture of it is if you are in a spot right now where you're like, ah, I just haven't been in the Word. I haven't been in the Bible for the last three or four weeks. Here you go. You got a reading list uh, for the next week to dive back into the Bible. There is so much here that honestly it would take me oh, I don't know, three or four hours to really teach you through this whole passage and go through and explain each of those references. But thankfully, I'm not the only person who can help you with 
this, right? Especially in our internet age, there are amazing tools out there. I hope you have a study Bible. Get an NIV study Bible. Uh, There are great online commentaries that explain verses, like Enduring Word is a great one. This will give you a way to go deep in the Word of this week. But really the main point that Jude is making through all of these examples is that what starts out in false belief ends up being a slippery slope all the way down to judgment. Now that's super serious, okay? And so we need to talk about this today. In fact, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the stages of the slippery slope of false belief. So let's start with the very first one, number one. It is essentially that, that the slippery slope starts with false belief. Not sin, false belief. So what happens is people put their belief in something else. Lots of times, even in Jude's day and in our day, it's usually in themselves. So the first example of this we see is in the middle of verse five. So in the middle of five, Jude says, I wanna remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. Now, uh, if you read the early books in the Bible, uh, some of the first books you'll see are Exodus and uh, Numbers. And if you read in those two books, you'll read the story of how God miraculously brought his people Israel out of slavery in Egypt and through the Red Sea. And yet, many of those people that experienced that still grumbled and didn't truly put their faith in God, which is crazy, right? But it happens, and it still happens today. There are people who grow up in amazing Christian families. And growing up, they even saw God do great things, and yet now they personally live a life of false belief. And there is no fruit, and there is no evidence of God's salvation and leadership in their life. Some of you personally, many of us personally have family members like this, and yet I still hear people say a lot, it's okay because I know that they accepted Jesus into their heart when they were six years old, and so they are saved. But many of those same people haven't followed Jesus a day in their life since they were six. And I just want to say to you, this is very hard and it's very tender, but I feel, I feel like I need to say this to you as your pastor. You need to stop saying that they are saved. They almost certainly are not. And you are hurting their chances of being saved by treating treating them like they are. It is only, the word of God says, it is only true belief that will save us. Not just saying special words. And true belief has fruit, it has evidence. Uh, This is another hard word. Uh, Maybe for some of you even in this room right now, Just sitting in these seats here today will not save you from God's judgment. Just as being amongst the Israelites who had been delivered from Egypt didn't save every person. It is only true and personal belief in God that can save us, not just association with a family member or a church. And we see this sort of false belief all over the Bible. You see it from the first pages. Even Cain, the firstborn of Adam, And Eve, who who Jude references in verse 11, he doesn't really have true faith and trust in God. And then Jude gives us another example of false belief. This is verses eight and nine. He says uh, the false believers of his day were heaping even verbal abuse on angels. And then to make his point, uh, Jude says that the archangel, that's the lead angel, Michael, didn't even slander the devil. Now this is a fascinating part because that isn't actually even in the Old Testament. So what is Jude even referring to? In fact, this is such a confusing, a fascinating verse that we dedicated our entire house group video uh, just to this verse this week, and we're gonna dive deep into this interesting verse. So get to house groups this week. Okay, so the slippery slope, it starts at a false belief, but then it leads to further decline. So let's go now to stage two. So the slippery slope starts at false belief, but then false belief leads to a rejection of God's authority. So Jude gets at this really from a couple of different examples. He says, verse eight, I see this in the false believers on my day. They reject authority, he says. Specifically, they're rejecting the authority of God. In fact, my friends, this is one of the easiest ways to tell a true believer from a false believer in the church. Because a true believer, you will see in their life that they take marching orders from good King Jesus in every arena of their life. A true believer believes that a authority 
for what is right, for what is true, for how we should live, authority they believe rests up on God's throne. But the false believer in the church rejects God's authority and instead believes that authority for how to live rests inside of them. And this is the transition of morality that we're seeing in our culture really over the last 20 or 30 years. Our culture is transitioning to this idea that we all can decide how to live for ourselves. And that sounds really good, right? But my friends, it gets messy so fast. And we're already seeing the rotten fruit of that in our culture over the last 10 to 15 years. This is a slippery slope. Okay, I want you to just kind of put your thinking caps on today. Do you think that without Christianity, do you think that our culture has sufficient moral reasoning to stop some of these situations, to stop, say, a pedophile who would say, I identify as someone who loves children. And in order for me to live out my truth, in order for me to be my authentic self, I need to act on that. In fact, if you don't let me act on that, you are risking my mental health and you are risking my life. Now, I I want you to think, how will secular society, that just means non-religious, how will secular society refute that sort of thinking? Like, what possibly do they have left to stand on? Now, there are some secular people who are still trying to keep the harm principle on life support. So in ethics and in morality, the harm principle is basically everybody can do whatever they want as long as they don't harm anyone. But I would just say back to them, if, if I was in a debate with them, I would say, well, why can't you harm someone? And I want you to notice how hard these questions are for secular people to answer without stealing reasoning from Christianity. Because most people would probably answer me back by saying, well, you can't harm another person because, well, you need to respect their autonomy and you need to protect and honor their human rights. And I would say, well, that's very Christian of you. Because those ideas do not come from secular society. Uh, Author uh, Rebecca McLaughlin uh, explains the contradiction uh, this way. She says, people now believe that things like universal human rights or racial justice or care for the poor are self-evident truths. But if there is no God that created us in his image, then human equality is a myth. And you can see that played out in tons of different societies in history around the world when people don't believe in God. Then human beings have no natural rights, just as spiders, hyenas, and chimpanzees have no natural rights. So what she's saying is, if life on earth was just accidentally created, and you are nothing but just an evolved animal, then you have no such thing as a right to not be harmed. Uh, Can a spider say to you, you can't harm me, I have rights? No, right? See, when we don't believe in God for who he truly is, and therefore we reject his authority, and thus we reject his truth, it leads to this slippery slope, and it doesn't lead to a better world. It leads to pain. Uh, This is Korah's rebellion that Jude references in, in verse 11. Korah was a man who rejected the authority of Moses and thus rejected God's authority. Why? Because Korah wanted to be in charge. And then God opens up the earth and he's swallowed up in Korah's rebellion. My friends, if you were here, and I know so many of you are new, but if you were here last fall, do you remember when we were going through John chapter five and I taught on the crushing crown You you do not, as a Christian or as a human being, you do not want to reject God's authority and put his crown on your head because you cannot bear the weight of it. Uh, Look at the warning in uh, verse six now. So verse six, Jude says, and the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, so they left heaven. These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. Now, uh, scholars are a bit actually divided on what Jude is referring to here. Some would say that he's actually referring to that very tricky chapter in Genesis chapter six, where it appears like the angels are coming down to marry the women of the earth. Uh, others feel like, no, Jude is actually just referring to when Satan uh, left heaven uh, with a third of the angels, and uh, some of them must have been locked up at this point. But the main point here is that 
the angels, much like Israel, they were living under the blessing and the goodness of God. They were living in heaven for goodness sakes, but they rebelled against God's authority, and Jude wants you to fear the consequences of rebellion. And I mean that word fear. The Bible talks a lot about fear, fearing the Lord. We don't talk about that in our culture, but it says we should fear, just logically, the repercussions of rebellion. And that may sound weird or even intense, but it's actually not that weird. I mean, this is how you parent your children, right? You teach them to fear the repercussions of running out into the road or of touching the stove. And we are to fear have a healthy fear of rejecting the authority of God over our lives because when we do that, when you go, you know, I don't need God anymore. At first, people have this false sense of freedom. Like, ha, I shook off God. But that false sense of freedom, it is just a mirage because they're gonna walk into more bondage and more sin and ultimately more pain. And that brings us to the third stage then of the slippery slope. So it starts with false belief. False belief leads to a rejection of God's authority and the rejection of God's authority. Then what happens, you can see this in society, it emboldens sensuality. Now, sensuality is just living to please your senses, uh, your flesh. Most of the time, uh, that refers to a life that is centered around pleasing sexual desires above all things. Although it doesn't have to be. Uh, Jude even references Balaam here. Uh, Balaam uh, was a bad prophet who went out to try and curse Israel just so he could like, make a lot of money. But Jude's main example of the third stage down on the slippery slope is verse 7. So take a look at verse 7. In verse 7, he says, In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah in the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Okay, so Sodom and Gomorrah are essentially, he's saying, an example of a society, of a city, where people have gone down the slippery slope. So it starts in false belief. Okay, they don't believe in the one true God. They have clearly rejected the authority of God. And now here at stage three on the slippery slope, they have given in fully to every sensual desire they have. Nothing is stopping them. Now, there is indeed a sexuality piece uh, to this passage of Sodom and Gomorrah, which we are going to treat uh, in great detail when we get to our sexuality a series. But for now, without me going 20 minutes, kind of in a different direction, let me just sort of summarize the story for you. So you have these two angels who in the story, they look, they appear like men. They come to Sodom and a man named Lot, who's really not all that great of a guy himself, at least brings them into his house for safety. And then this happens. So we'll put it on the screen. This is Genesis 19 uh, verse four. It says, before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. And so this city is so far gone, so driven by every sensual desire that all of the men of the town, Young and old want to rape the angels who have come to their city. And somehow the angels find a way to get out of the city and get Lot and his family out of the city before God rains down burning sulfur of judgment on the city. Oh my friends, this is so serious. This is, this is why Jude urges us as followers of Jesus to contend for the faith so that the slippery slope does not begin. Contend, my friends, for a real version, a biblical version of grace, one that says God sets you free from sin, not free to sin. One that says God will come into your life and if you let him in, he will show you a better way of living, so much better than you just giving in to every sensual desire. Because history tells us, and I would say history warns us, that societies that live just for sensual pleasure and they let go of all moral guardrails, when you let go of all the guardrails, there is nothing then to stop a society from driving off a cliff. Uh, and, And the Roman Empire is a perfect example of this. Again, I just urge you, think 
Let's just not go with the culture. Let's just not go with our desires. Just think logically with me. Freedom, because we talk a lot about freedom in our culture. I just want the freedom to be me, to be myself, to do what I want. Freedom is not the absence of guardrails or constraints. Uh, Timothy Keller explains it this way. He, he says, okay, if you, if you take a fish and you free a fish from the lake and you put it out on the grass to explore, that fish is not more free because you have now removed it from the constraints of water. The fish is less free if it can't honor the reality of how it was made. And we as human beings are less free if our guiding principle of life is just to follow every possible desire that we have. True freedom is found in living under the constraints that God has put in place for us because he loves us. Just like I love my children and so I put constraints on their life. Uh, This is what I, I just long, I long for people to understand. When a person denies God and they throw off his authority, it does not lead to better living, it does not lead to freer living, it does not lead to higher living, it actually leads to lower living. This is what Jude is trying to explain about the slippery slope in verse 10. In verse 10, he writes, Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand, and the very things they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. And so Judas is essentially saying, okay, these false believers, they don't understand spiritual things, but the very thing that they think they do understand, the very thing that they're very passionate about is doing whatever their instincts tell them to do. It's doing whatever their heart wants to. They're following their heart. Whatever they find inside of them, they are following. And Jude says, like irrational animals, that, that path will destroy them. And my friends, here is the great irony. This is the brilliance of the word of God. Although there are false believers in the church today and there are non-Christians out there who would say that by throwing this off, that they have proclaimed that they have a new morality, that they've got an intellectual superiority, that they've thrown away the old and antiquated ways and the barbaric ways, Jude says, ironically, they are actually now living lower than ever because now they are living like the animals that they are living like beings who only make their decisions based on base natural instinct rather than living by the higher law that God himself has placed in our hearts and placed in his word. And so Jude warns, he warns that if you fall this far down on the slippery slope that the only thing left is destruction. And that is the fourth and final stage of the slippery slope. That rejection of God emboldens sensuality, and sensuality, and honestly, just sin, leads to judgment. These are hard words. They're the words that we skip all the time because we don't even know what to do with them. But my friends, these words are in here from God himself to warn us. They are warnings that bad ideas have consequences. That false belief leads to repercussions and difficulty and pain and ultimately judgment because God is a holy God who will judge all of us for our sin. And and let me just interject this because I, as your pastor, I worry that some of us may be interpreting the book of Jude incorrectly. And I think that's possible because we live in such a polarized world right now. And so some of us are used to just hearing stuff all day long. We're like, we're right, everybody else is a mess. And so I worry that in this polarized world in which we live, that some of you are hearing the letter of Jude, and by hearing it, you are wrongly propping yourself up on a pedestal. And even in your mind, as I've been preaching, you're going, yeah, (laughs) those people are so dumb. And they are so wrong. And they are so just in bondage to sex and sensuality and shame on them. And I just want to say to you, my friends, that is not the heart of Christ. That is not the heart of Christ for people. It is not the heart of Christ for lost 
people To say, they've done this, we haven't, we're better, is the heart of a Pharisee. It is to prop yourself up above everyone else. But the gospel says that no, we are human beings and we struggle. Have you never had a moment of false belief and unbelief and doubt? Have you never had a moment where you rejected the authority of God? I have. Where you say, God, I know this is what you say, but I'm sorry, I'm going this way today. Has your rejection of God never led to sensuality? Anyone pure in the room? Anyone never lusted? Jesus says even to lust in your mind is to commit adultery in your heart. And so I just urge you, come, if you're on a pedestal, come down, my friend. You and I, too, have sinned against God. And that sin was taking us, not everybody else, us, too, on the slippery slope that was going to lead to the judgment of God for our sin. And so as Christians, the only thing that we have to stand on, it is not our moral superiority, it's not our intellectual superiority, it's not anything that we did. The only thing we have to stand on is the fact that Jesus Christ, in his mercy, saw us sliding down the slippery slope and reached out his hand to grab us. That is the only thing we have to stand on. That Jesus Christ came to earth and he lived the life that we couldn't. And Jesus Christ came to earth and he died the death that we deserve. And the Bible says it is through our faith in him, not through our better ideas, not through our moral superiority, it is through our faith in him and grabbing his hand that we are saved. Believing that he died in our place for our sins. It's by grabbing his hand, getting pulled off the rescue, off the slippery slope that you can be rescued. And you can be rescued, not just into salvation, you can be rescued into a new life. Into a new way of walking with God and knowing him and knowing him personally. And then ultimately rescued from the end, from judgment, from destruction, from hell, because Jesus Christ, even if he has seen you falling, has come to save you. That's amazing. Some of you are falling right now. I urge you, grab his hand. Some of you just need to come back to him. Grab his hand. It doesn't get better the farther you go. Grab his hand. And some of you, you just need to grab his hand for the very first time. He loves you. Let him save you. And I'm telling you, he can transform your life. And we testify about that here.